everybody, it's Dr. Karen. So this week we have been talking about the three essential components to pragmatic language intervention. So intervention that helps individuals who have social cognitive issues to function in social situations. So yesterday I talked about the first component that we need to have in order to have a successful intervention. And today I wanted to talk about component number two. But let me give you the overview of what we've talked about so far so that you can get an overview. So first of all, the reason that a lot of pragmatic language interventions and social skills interventions fail is often because people don't have the right framework and what they're doing is going backwards. So they're worried about a lot of those things that yes, we have a lot of pressure to, to do like taking data, writing goals, or even coming up with the best techniques that have evidence behind them, um, or even um, pulling the right materials and videos and flashcards and, and whatever it is that you're using in therapy. And so we're worried about those things. And yes, we do have to make sure that we're using evidence-based practices. We do have to make sure we have good materials, we have to take data, write goals, all of those things. But the reason that a lot of times you might be worrying about those things and not getting the results that you want is because often there are some foundational things that have to do with your therapy framework that aren't in place. And that is why often kids who have social skills issues continue to struggle even though they've had years and years of intervention. So I wanted to talk about those three components. So again, the three components that we need in order to get our students to have effective social functioning skills is that there needs to be a clear roadmap for diagnosing and coming up with our goals that's going to align with the right treatment. So that's what we talked about yesterday. And I talked about how we want to use the six categories of social impairment to do that. So that's going to guide our roadmap because we need a roadmap. We need to be able to pick that apart and figure out what our students really are struggling with because sometimes social skills are so easy for us that it might be hard for us to figure out, okay, what is the discrete skill or what are those sets of skills that our student is struggling with that are keeping them from being able to function. So if we don't have the right skill and we're not focusing on the right area, obviously our students won't get better. So I'm gonna share a link to yesterday's video so that you can go back and watch that just in case you missed it. So again, component number one of your effective pragmatic language intervention is coming up with that roadmap that's gonna guide your diagnosis, that's gonna set you up to pick the right treatment techniques. Number two, we wanna make sure that we have explicit intervention. So it doesn't matter if you pick the right intervention or if you pick the right area of focus, if it doesn't include some component of explicit instruction. Then third, we need to make sure that once we do those first two components, we give our students practice in appropriate situations with the right frequency. So that's what's going to equal our good social functioning and help our students to have those functional, happy, healthy lives. So we talked about number one yesterday, which is your roadmap. So today I wanted to dive into the second component, which is explicit intervention. So the thing is, is that uh, a lot of times when we are trying to help students with language, we, we might be just exposing them to a situation and asking them to do something over and over again, but not actually taking the time to teach them the skills that they're, they're lacking. So obviously, in order to do this effectively, we need to know what those skills are. But then once we've outlined that and figured that out, we need to make sure that our interventions are explicit. Because the thing is, is that um, we know that individuals with language difficulties don't necessarily learn certain skills. They're not as obvious to them. Remember, with social skills, it's kind of a hidden curriculum. So it's not something that most people need in order to, in order to do effectively. A lot of us don't need to sit down with somebody and learn how to have a conversation directly. But some of these rules like nonverbal communication, reciprocity and terminating interaction, um, starting that interaction, monitoring and self, uh, self-awareness, all of those things uh, that I talked about yesterday with the six categories of impairment, we have to be able to teach those explicitly. And I say this and it sounds really obvious. 
And the tenant that you want to remember is that if we want individuals with social pragmatic language difficulties to have effective social skills, we need to teach them to have effective social skills. And this sounds so obvious, and most of us think, yeah, I'm doing that, but when we actually look at the areas that they're struggling, we realize that we're not. So that's the key is having that roadmap, because if you don't have the roadmap, if you don't know what those six categories of social impairment are, you're not going to be able to know what am I actually teaching effectively. So the thing is, is that there are a lot of effective uh, or great curriculums and materials out there. There are a lot of good interventions. We've got social stories. We've got social scripts. We've got video modeling, all of those different things. But if we don't know what skills we're teaching and we're not teaching them directly within that situation, then our students are not going to get better. So let me let me tell you an example. So for let's say that you wanted to utilize role play for one of your strategies. Well, that is an evidence based practice. Um, so in theory, you would think I'm using an effective therapy technique obviously like it's going to work like there's there's evidence to show that this is an effective way to build social skills well let's say that you have a student and again let's going back to those six categories of impairment which again were um, nonverbal communication um, so things like eye contact gestures, body language, social initiation, reciprocity and terminating interaction, social cognition, self-awareness and perspective taking, and social anxiety and withdrawal. So those are your six categories. So let's say that you've got your first component down. You've identified that um, your student is struggling with nonverbal communication, so they're not interpreting body language, and they're also having a hard time um, with reciprocity and continuing interactions. So let's say that you're doing some kind of a role play and you're working on conversation. And you just, so you know, okay, in a conversation you have to utilize nonverbal behaviors and pay attention to them. Um, you have to also have reciprocity and go back and forth in an interaction. And if you just set your students up and you just have them do the role play, and just expose them to that situation over and over again where they are going to have to use those skills, but you don't actually teach them. All you're doing is just repeatedly asking a student over and over again to do a skill that's hard for them. So it would be like if, um, and again, I use the swimming analogy a lot, but it would be like if uh, somebody didn't know how to swim and we thought, okay, well, a good opportunity to swim, a good opportunity to use those skills is to have them swim laps in the deep end over here. We know that swimming laps works. It's an effective way to build up your fitness and practice your skills. It'll give you that repetition. And we know that we need to be doing it in deep water so that people have to have that opportunity to practice those skills. But then we don't ever take the time to teach them what to do with their arms, what to do with their legs, how to position their body and their head so that they're in the right position in the water so that they're not sinking, all of those things. And then we're like, we just repeatedly ask them to do it over and over again. We're all, a lot of these strategies, even though they're evidence-based, um, if we're not teaching the right skill, it's not going to be helpful. Um, for example, again, if you're just having them role play over and over again in your therapy, but you haven't identified and explicitly taught those correct skills and sat down and explained all of the nonverbal behaviors and taught them how to use them effectively or taught them how to have that conversation and taught them how to continue that conversation, then obviously they're not going to get better. Another example is that let's say that we are not aligning our explicit teaching up with our roadmap. So let's say that you picked an evidence-based strategy and you are explicitly teaching something but you're not teaching the right skills so this is a problem where um, we don't we're not necessarily using using the roadmap effectively so for example let's say that they are struggling with social initiation which is starting that conversation and you're focused on initiating or you're, you're focused on continuing that interaction. Well, you can't continue an interaction if you can't start the interaction. So 
again, we need to be able to align our explicit teaching up with that roadmap and what our students are actually struggling with. We have to be not just explicit teaching, but teaching the right skills. So in that example, let's say that you're spending time explaining how to go back and forth and make comments in a conversation, but you've never taken the time to teach them how to start the conversation in the first place. Again, it would be like, you know, if people were struggling to move their arms when they're swimming and you're teaching them over here how to move their legs. Well, if you're not teaching the thing that they are struggling with and the skill that they're, they need to have, then obviously it's not going to get better. And so here's another thing. And again, today we're really focusing on explicit teaching and how important it is to, number one, make sure that you are being very direct with your students and not just putting them in situations over and over again without giving them the chance to actually learn and giving them an explanation of what they should be doing. Um, but, but also just how sometimes we can have a technique that has tons of research behind it, but if these things aren't aligning, if you haven't aligned with what they need to work on and found a way to directly teach it to them, then it's not going to work. So for example, and this is just a study that I found really interesting, again, the seminal study that was done back in 1999, where they actually looked at, for language facilitation techniques, they looked at what behaviors actually were accounted for the treatment effectiveness. And so, you know, we, we focus a lot of time on techniques, but when they actually broke this down in the study, number one, so... Uh, there were four different factors that they looked at. So the first one was extra therapeutic and client factors. So this could be things like factors related to the client's environment or other things outside of therapy. So again, um, there could be all these other things going on with the, with the client. Um, this, this also has to do with motivation as well. So, uh, Extra therapeutic and client factors actually accounted for 40% of treatment outcomes. So that's almost half. So it's kind of a lot. Then number two was the therapeutic relationship, the relationship that you have with your clients. And that accounted for 30%. So right now we've got extra therapeutic and client factors accounting for 40% of treatment outcomes. And then we've got the therapeutic relationship accounting for 30%. So we've already got 70% and we haven't even talked tech techniques yet. The next one was hope and expectation, 15%. And then finally, technique accounted for 15%. So what can we take away from this? Is that all four of these things accounted for some treatment impact? So all of them accounted for something. So we need to do all of those things. We need to focus on the relationship and their attitude and the actual technique but there are so many other things that can impact how well our students are doing that we need to make sure that we're not just so obsessed with goals and techniques and things like that because actually building that relationship with your client and being aware of how to have an impact on other environmental things outside of what's going on in therapy can actually have a bigger impact than you spending tons of time trying to get the perfect technique or set of materials. And this is why I talk about this related to explicit teaching. Think about, you know, again, all of these clients are so frustrated. So when you actually sit down and take the time to listen and really understand where they're struggling and then teach it to them, the fact that you are taking the time to do that and pay attention to them can actually build that therapeutic relationship. So having that explicit uh, therapy technique or that explicit instruction component can actually not only be effective, regardless of what treatment technique you're using, but it can also help build that relationship. And what it can also do is that when you build that relationship, what's going to happen is that's going to impact the other things like extra therapeutic and client factors. So those outside things, if you have a better relationship with your client, you're going to be more in tune to what's going on outside. So that means that you're going to have potential to have a greater impact on those other factors as well that happen outside of therapy because you're going to have a better understanding. Your client's going to be more likely to share those things. So that means that 
explicit instruction actually supports those things that have the biggest impact on therapy. And at the same time, it allows you to take a technique that is evidence-based and do it explicitly and make sure that it aligns with where that student is struggling. So again, the point today, the component that we're talking about here is direct instruction. If we want our students to have effective social skills, we need to be very direct with them and actually teach them. So that's one thing. But then we also need to be better listeners and actually focus on what our student is lacking and what they need and what matters to them because that's going to help build that relationship. And if we're not taking the time to sit down and directly explain things to our students, we're not going to be in tune with those things. So that's why component number two, explicit instruction, is so important to actually having a good impact with your therapy. All right. So we're going to wrap up today. Again, what we talked about are those three components to effective social pragmatic intervention, your roadmap, which is figuring out those six categories of impairment and figuring out how they actually align with what your student needs, then taking the next step and making sure that you are directly teaching whatever by whatever technique that you pick, that within that technique, you are showing your client that they care and you are doing it effectively by actually directly teaching them the behaviors that they need to do in order to be effective. So the third one is practice. We'll get into that tomorrow. I'll talk a little bit about how that additionally supports those things like extra, extra therapeutic factors. So factors outside of therapy. I'll talk a little bit more about how that practice element actually can have an impact on those four things that that support our client's outcomes. And again, those were extra therapeutic and client factors, um, the therapeutic relationship, hope and expectation, and also the therapy technique. Again, what's crazy is that the, the technique is actually one of the things that is the least impactful. Things like factors outside of therapy actually account for more than double of what the technique focuses on. So sometimes getting the bigger picture of your intervention and then just inserting those techniques in afterwards is actually the better route to go. So we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow and why practice is so important. But now what I wanted to do for those of you who wanted to take your learning a step further, I actually have, again, last year I opened up a program called the Social Language Roadmap, which guides you through this framework that I'm talking about that can help you to implement those three components, that can help you to figure out how to diagnose those six areas of impairment so you can figure out exactly where your student is struggling, pick the right goals, pick the right techniques, know that you're teaching the right skills, and then logistically figure out how to do that and give your students the right practice they need so that they can actually feel supported and empowered and, and succeed in social situations. So the Social Language Roadmap is a program for SLPs who are helping individuals with social pragmatic difficulties to function socially. So it'll give you a complete co protocol for pragmatic language intervention. Um, you can actually get it now for the introductory rate this fall. It is going to be going up later on. However, you can still get in at the introductory rate. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually double. So what we cover in the program is we start off by talking about what it truly takes to have effective social interventions and or social interactions and why a lot of the pre-made materials that we have often miss the mark so that you'll figure out exactly where your student needs to be and what you need to change when it comes to your intervention. And the second section, I'll dive into those three components that I just talked about today and then talk about, okay, now that we figured out where we're going wrong, what do we actually need to do? What are the components that we need in order to have effective social interactions and how do we teach our students that? Section three, we'll talk about um, intervention planning and goal writing. And then section four is the brand new advanced intervention tutorials where I'll give you detailed tutorials about those specific techniques and then how to work that into a complete system so that your student is having the practice that they actually need. So it's beyond just what's going on in your therapy room. It's the big picture of how you're supporting your students and what's going on 
across settings. So if you're tired of digging through materials that don't help your students generalize, or stressing out if you're doing evidence-based practice, or just tired of seeing your students miss out on genuine social connections, and you're ready to finally see your students relate to other people in an authentic and functional way, um, you want them to finally see, feel successful in their academic environment, start making some of those lasting friendships and enjoy social interactions, and unlock their capacity to adapt to those social situations and function so that they can have happy, healthy, functional lives, then come join me in the Social Language Roadmap. So I'm going to drop a link in the comments so that you can actually see the sign up page there. It's also in the description above the post. There it is right there. So thank you so much for listening today. Again, you can still get the Social Language Roadmap program for half of what the tuition is going to be in the future. So I'd love to have you join me. Love to have you, uh, love to see you in the members area. I'll wrap this up for now. Tomorrow we'll, I'll come back and talk about that third component of practice and bring it all together for you. But for now, thank you so much for listening.